Hi, thanks for having me over here. It's been a few years since I was in Perth. Last time I had um, emergency dental surgery, so I'm really, fingers crossed, I'll be okay this time. Um, uh, yeah, so as Anthony said, I used to work at THQ. I worked at THQ for seven years. I actually used to head up marketing for Asia Pacific before I moved into the studio side of the business last year. Uh, six months later, they shut the studios down, and um, as everyone else was going indie, I thought, well, maybe I'll go indie, and, uh, but on the marketing side, and I've set up a small, very small agency at the moment. Uh, working with indies, I've got about 15 studios I work with, mostly in Melbourne at the moment and uh, some up in Sydney as well. Mostly mobile stuff, but we're starting to get into PC and other things. So um, when Anthony and Nick asked me to come over for this, I had a thought about what I could do to help you. And um, rather than just doing a talk, what I wanted to do was something practical. So uh, tonight what we're going to do is, is basically my positioning workshop, which is a key part of what I do with clients towards the beginning of a campaign. And um, as we go through, essentially, I will do a short presentation on really what is positioning, why is it important. And then the bulk of the session will actually be a practical exercise where you'll get the chance to kind of go through the workshop, um, learn the process of, uh, of what's involved, and, uh, and hopefully you come out of it with some, uh, something practical and sort of actually uh, useful on, the, on your specific project. Um, what we won't have time to do today is sort of go through in enough time. The, the process normally takes about two hours for me with a client, with me guiding them. Um, but hopefully what we'll be able to do is kind of rush through it tonight and then you'll be able to repeat the process with other members of your team if you've got a, other members of your team that aren't here um, or do it again yourself um, like a second time to sort of go through fully. Um, what I won't do is questions probably until we actually get into the practical section just from a, a time point of view. So if you do have any questions in this initial part, maybe just store them up and then ask them as we, as we go through. Cool. So let's see if we can get this to work. What is positioning? So this is the Wikipedia definition. Um, you know, the process by which you create an image or identity in the mind of the consumer. But essentially positioning is what is interesting about your game or film or product or coffee, whatever the item is. Positioning is, is trying to work out well, what is it, how does it fit into the space, how does it fit into the consumer's life and why should they care about it. So the three real reasons why positioning is really important and it's ideal to do it sort of fairly early into the process of your, of your product. Um, the first is differentiation, um, okay, when you've got a lot of products and we all know how many indie games are out there, how many apps are added to the app store every week, you need to be able to differentiate yourself from everybody else, which is a really hard thing to do. Console world, it's not quite so hard because there's nowhere near as many console games coming out, it's a much more um, exclusive club. Indie games are really, really crowded, so you have to be able to differentiate. Um, secondly, you need to develop your elevator pitch, as Tim was saying, you've got to come up with that first sentence that's going to hook them. The positioning process is part of how you get to that elevator pitch. And lastly, positioning can help you find out what's the real value of your game. Okay, and this may be something that you don't even realize as you're developing your game. I had an example recently, I, I met with a guy from Canada that was over in Melbourne for a while developing a game. He, he felt like he couldn't, didn't really have a hook or, or a key thing bringing everything together. We sat down for three hours and about halfway through he showed me a screenshot which was a, basically a, an old man talking to a little girl and it completely didn't fit with the rest of the game which was a Zelda style RPG. And he goes, oh yeah, by the way, the whole thing is being told by the old man to the little girl as a story just like Princess Bride. And I was like, well, holy shit, that's the interesting thing. And it was something that he just showed me as a random screenshot. And now he's basing his whole game around the premise of this is actually a book being read to a kid and how he can play with the whole function of the game as a, as a basis of that hook. Um, he hadn't worked that out, but it was only in the process of talking about, well, what's actually interesting, what's your game about, that he discovered that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these in detail. So differentiation. Um, games are a commodity. Indie games are a commodity. I'm sorry to say this, it breaks my heart to say it, but they're a commodity because any time I can pick up you know, my mouse or my phone and choose some 100,000 different games that are all going to entertain me, it's a commodity. Um, just like coffee, coffee is a commodity, okay? And the problem with commodities is price gets driven down and it's really hard to stand out because they all do basically the same thing. So this is your challenge. You are a new brand of coffee on a supermarket aisle. There's six, 60, 70 other brands that do the same thing essentially. How the hell are you going to stand out? And this is why you need positioning to say, well, where in there can I find a unique space that's going to attract some attention? What's key with differentiation though is not to just go with, oh, I'm kind of like this, but you know, there's this one different thing that we do. 
you have to find, and you can't really see it here because the colour's all washed out on the projector, but this is actually a purple cow. Um, all those cows are slightly different, but probably the only one that you really notice is the purple one, or you would if the colour was brighter. Um, what matters is the thing that makes you really different, not the things that make you a little bit different. And I've seen this in the console world. Launched a game called Conan, which was pretty much a God of War style game. It's actually a really good game. But when the developers pitched it to us, it was all about, well, it's kind of like God of War, but you know, we've got more weapons and more moves that the guy can do. It's really boring. No one wants to know that you're kind of like this thing, but you've got a little bit more of what it does. You, know, you have to do, why am I really different? Why am I going to stand out? And there's a great book called The Purple Cow. Uh, by Seth Godin, which I recommend to anyone. It's a really easy marketing book to read. It's all about this concept of the need to stand out in the, uh, the economy today because we're in an attention economy and there's so many things that people can give their attention to, you have to stand out to grab them. And this is you know, a great example of why differentiation can be so powerful. You know, the Mac and Microsoft ads that are pretty much instantly recognisable to people. Um, really, really powerful use of, you know, this is our part of the market and that's your part of the market. You know, and Apple have done a fantastic job of defining themselves um, as this guy, basically. Um, and if I can get the ad to run, I'm sure you've all seen these. But um, you know, they've, they've used this in their advertising so powerfully that Microsoft is you know, pretty much screwed compared to Apple in terms of how they're positioning their brand. Uh, let's get some volume. Well, Vista comes in six different versions. I, I don't know which to choose. I could spend a lot of money and get a version that has a lot of stuff I don't need, or spend too little and get stuck with one that doesn't do very much at all. Mm -hmm. We may just have one version with all the stuff you need already. Well, that's boring. This is fun. Come on, big operating system, big operating system. Daddy needs an upgrade. Didn't you make this? Okay. There we go. Uh, so, elevator pitch. Uh, just as. Um, Tim was saying you need an opening sentence, you need a two sentence pitch where people kind of go, okay, I'm interested, tell me more. Okay, people don't want to hear the 10 page pitch and they certainly don't want to wait until page 10 to hear the thing that's actually interesting. So you need to develop an elevator pitch, whether it's to the consumer, whether it's to the press, whether it's to an investor, um, you know, whoever it is you need to talk to, you've got to have a pitch and positioning really helps you define what that pitch is and find that hook. So here's a couple of examples. This is a game that I launched on Tuesday. It's called Ballistic Unleashed. It's an iOS uh, Angry Birds style game um, with a twist. Um, the twist is it's incredibly crude. It's very robot chicken, very South Park humor. As you can see, the ball is in fact being pulled back by its uh, stretchy scrotum and launched across a shopping mall where it crushes people. There's lots of blood and gore um, and so on. It's uh, basically uh, this was a game that came to me last year that we started working on and uh, during the positioning process it was pretty clear that the, you know, the hook wasn't going to be the gameplay, although it had some very good gameplay uh, variations to how Angry Birds work and in fact really the flinging across the screen is pretty much the only thing that it keeps from Angry Birds. But we knew that we weren't going to be able to differentiate ourselves on the gameplay because people can't see past a game like that, just like you can't do a third person cover shooter without someone bringing up Gears of War. Right? What we realised was that we had to put everything onto the crudeness and the humour in the game and we actually upped the level of it until we got it to the point where we thought we couldn't get any more through Apple. Um, and this is working brilliantly, it's got coverage across ma all the ma major iOS sites so far, more reviews are coming in. Um, it's got coverage on uh, The Verge and a number of gaming blogs as well because it's pushing the edge. Um, and you know, a lot of people are really loving it on the forums because it's something different. You know, and all I had to do was write a physics game with dick jokes as the subject line to some of the emails, and of course people want to read that. You know, and then they can get into the other stuff. Um, here's one that's a bit more highbrow. This was a game we launched in February called Super Lemonade Factory, which is a sort of 8-bit uh, pixel art platformer. Um, the key hook is that you have two characters that you switch between, and you have to use both of them to get to the end of the level. Unfortunately, that's not particularly exciting. There's a few other games that have done it, and the platforming wasn't at the top end of, you know, it wasn't like, oh my god, this is the best retro platformer ever. And there's a lot of them, right? However, uh, as we play through the game, we realise the female character has this lovely characteristic that she can talk to the other characters in the game, which are actually your enemies. And uh, this is kind of like bizarre post-World War II social commentary plot going on that has very little to do with the core mechanics of the game, but it was really different. So the pitch line on this one, uh, Super Lemonade Factory is a game about gender roles, moral dilemmas in wartime, industrial relations, and crates, because the core gameplay mechanic is crates, right? And again, huge pickup because of that, because it's not very often you get a, uh, an email saying, hey, a game about gender relations, right? And even though that's not a major part of the game, it was the hook that gets people in 
to the game and then they're interested. Okay, so real value, so just like the old you know, classic story of people, kids playing with the box instead of the toy, people, you know, that, the reason why that story is important is because there's a truth there. You know, sometimes the value in something isn't what you think it is and it's in fact something else. And, uh, and as I say, doing your positioning, you may find that in fact the value is entirely different to what you thought it was. And this is a classic example um, of how this can, can come true. So here I've got two adverts. One, the Japanese advert for the original GoldenEye on N64. And uh, secondly, the revamped advert that Activision put out for the Wii version. And let's see. So if you had to say, what is that ad selling you on? Selling you on, anybody? Okay, it's selling you on being James Bond. 90% of the ad is two dudes playing as being James Bond. It's like, you play this game, you get to be James Bond, right? The, uh, the ad for the Wii version is completely different. So that ad is selling you on, yeah, the multiplayer, right? What was the real value in that game when it came out? The multiplayer, right? So originally they didn't know what they had. And of course the second time around they knew exactly what they had. And it wasn't about, you know, even James Bond, it was hardly about any of the gameplay. They're selling you on the experience that you get out of it, which was you sat around on a couch with three of your other mates playing a game. So what we're going to do for the workshop is uh, basically work through the sheets that you've got there. Um, there's a few different sections. So um, what we start off with is a, what I call is-isn't. It's kind of like a warm-up exercise to get going. And uh, basically in this section you're just talking about anything at all that describes the game. Okay? And it's a process of just thinking about what the game is, but also specifically what it isn't. And you'll find that the isn'ts are more important than the is. Because as you're defining it and you're saying, well, I really don't want it to be this. You know, that tends to be a stronger emotion than the, than the is-is. Uh, and then we look at competitive variance. Now this is a session that we're going to do very quickly here, but I actually t typically spend a lot of time on this for each of my clients um, before I come to the workshop, um, doing research and so on in terms of what are the other games doing and, and how do I compare myself to them. Um, emotional rewards, so again, using that golden eye as an example, both of those were emotional sales as opposed to feature sales. Um, features don't sell games, it's the emotional reward you get from a game that actually really sells it. It, and it's hard when you're a developer because you're so focused on, okay, what are the features, what are the modes, how many levels have I got, what are the different mechanics, but it's actually the result of those for the player that really connects with people you know, and makes a difference. So if you can get to the emotional rewards of your game, it, it's, it takes you a long way towards getting to that hook. Uh, personality, you know, and, and the Apple is a great example of, of uh, you know, um, how they can personify the, the, the product and how you can kind of bring it to life and give it tone and, and character. And also a thing I like to call Friends in Bizarro. Um, and this is essentially a way to kind of visualise all the things that you're working through in the workshop. And essentially it's, it's talking about things like, hmm, if my game was a car, which car would it be? If my game, you know, what clothing would my, car, would my game wear? What sort of music would it listen to? And so it builds up a picture in your mind of the things that you've been talking about all the way through in terms of personality and so on because you're projecting it onto real world things that you can connect with. And what you get out of that, importantly, is kind of like a visual board because you just go to Google Images and grab all the images for those things and you have a very clear representation that you can kind of connect with. The, the danger of all these things is you write down the word, but the word can mean a whole bunch of things. So it's, it's good to kind of bring it out into real life. Um, and then finally at the back, there's kind of like a summary where you just bring together the top messages out of each of the sections to kind of uh, bring it to a whole. So what we'll essentially do for each of these sessions is spend about 10 minutes um, on it just individually or if you're in a team here then uh, definitely talk about it between yourselves 
Um, and then what I want to do is spend about five minutes in each of these sessions with you just sharing it with the person next to you so that you can uh, get a bit of experience of seeing what they've written, what you've written, and so on, and talking about it. Um, as I say, what I, what I should suggest that you do after this is maybe give it a week and then come back to this exercise, go back through the workbook. If there's other people in your team that aren't here tonight, then definitely involve them. Or if there's other developers that you know or other friends, get them involved because a group discussion is always better than just sitting there by yourself doing this, right? But hopefully what you get out of this is um, the process, the tools. It's a very simple process once you've done it once to repeat. You don't necessarily need a lot of expert you know, knowledge to do it. What I'll do on each stage is basically introduce it, explain what to do uh, with the worksheets. And then if you've got questions, shout out and we'll do them. And then during the, the 15 minutes, I'll come around and, and chat to you guys as well and just sort of see how, how it's... Okay, so is, isn't, as I say, um, it's basically this can be anything at all that describes the game, but some example things you might want to think about, you know, what hardware platforms is the game on, what distribution platform is it on, if it's not a game, you know, how's it being delivered to, to people, uh, what's your business model, what genre and mechanic, input method, um, what sort of meta game is it, is it like an endless runner or is it level based or is it a multiplayer game, is it cooperative or competitive and so on, um, what age rating are you talking about, how are you actually developing it, you know, for example, are you designing the whole thing on paper and then building it or are you building prototypes and iterating um, you know, is it the team? Is the team here? Is it one person? Is it ten people? Is it, you know, distributed, etc.? Um, what art style, narrative style, style of play experience, or any, anything else that you want to put in there that uh, you feel is important about the game, and anything which you feel it definitely isn't, and anything that you definitely don't want it to be. Okay, so um, we'll go for ten minutes, and then I'll let you know ten minutes is gone, and we can you can talk to the person next to you. So it's a 2D platformer game, which involves a lot of free fall downwards movements. 2D fighter for the iPad. Uh, okay, so it's a casual physics based platformer um, where the world comes to you. Like you don't go anywhere in this platformer, the world just comes to you. Well, we worked on a game for Ludo Dare, which is on our game making competition. Uh, my one line pitch is uh, dismembering zombies with Olympic sport equipment. Okay, so the next section we're talking about is competitive variance. Um, so competitive variance is basically all about looking at the competition, any kind of reference game. So it could be a game that's inspiring you, it could be a game that you know, is directly doing a very similar thing to you. Basically any game that is going to come to the minds of the consumer when they're playing your game um, is an important reference point for you because they're going to be interpreting your game through that. Uh, and basically competitive variance is really just looking at those games and saying, okay, what is it in my game that I do more of than them or less of than them, what's different, what's new. What you're really looking for is the one thing that really pulls you out, that makes you so different, the purple cow moment essentially. Um, so this, this exercise is basically what you need to do first off is just look at some titles that you know are comparative titles um, and then thinking about those titles, um, basically on this side you're looking at, okay, what are the things that I do the more of? So um, say for example, um, it was a game that only had five levels but your game's going to be the same thing and I'm going to do, hey, I'm going to do 50 levels. So I'm going to give people the same kind of experience but I'm going to give them a massively larger version of that experience, right? Or maybe it's, you know, I'm going to give them a lot less of that experience or I'm going to have um, less complicated, less mechanics to deal with. It's going to be a more casual version of that experience and so on, right? And then start thinking about, okay, but, you know, within this genre, what is the thing that I'm doing differently? So it might be that, you know, you're an endless runner game, like a temple run, but, you know, I'm using weapons as well as just running, so I've got an additional mechanic there that, that's being involved or whatever. Um, and hopefully what you get out of this is a bit of an idea of, okay, what are my strong points? What are the things when I'm talking to people that are really interested in this kind of game? What are the things that I'm going to shout about? And which are the things that perhaps, you know, that just, you know, I'm doing them, but everyone else in the genre is doing. What you're going to be able to do today is a very small part of this section. What I would encourage you to do, like I say, is, is download all the games that are similar, research them, and do, spend a lot more time kind of um, doing what I call is like a genre analysis and trying to figure out well what are the trends within the genre and then how do I stand out from that. But at least today you'll, you'll get a chance to kind of, I guess, start on this process and this is definitely a section to come back to once you've done that research and have a shot on. Now we need to talk about emotions. 
So people talk a lot about emotions in gaming. What they're normally talking about is empathy, uh, which is basically I can feel what the artist was feeling when they created the artwork or what the character is feeling, right? But there's a lot of emotional rewards involved in any product. Um, and these are just a few of the ones that you'll find in gaming. Um, your product will have emotional rewards. It will have probably a lot of these. Most games have a, a sort of common subset of, of emotions that um, people feel when they're playing a game. Um, what I want you to do is actually order these into priority and add any other ones that you want to because the blend will be different, right? So um, an example, mastery is basically the idea that, okay, I'm playing the game, I'm learning the rule set, I'm getting good, and, uh, and how far can I go in getting good? So a game like Street Fighter is a classic mastery game. The, the players, top end players of that have got it down to the number of frames of animation of a particular move, right? It's a super, super deep masterful game. It's also got a hell of a lot of adrenaline. You know, in there. Um, other games like a civilization or any sort of strategy game is heavy on the mastery. Um, some games are just about the adrenaline or just about the reactions. Um, some games are, you know, sad experiences. Some games are really happy experiences and so on. Um, so there's a, there's a whole bunch on here. Um, thinking about your game, thinking about the player and what they're experiencing as they're playing the game. What are they experiencing? What are the most prominent emotions that they're going to be experiencing from this list? The key thing with this is to get beyond your feature set. Okay, like I was saying before, as developers, as people in the games industry, it's so easy to talk about features, number of levels, number of enemies, and all this kind of stuff, because you have to for the design. But players don't engage with something because it's got 20% more levels than this other game. They engage with something on the emotional feeling. So um, this is really trying to get you to think beyond the features and the other stuff that you talk about and get into the actual experience, which is really what you're selling at the end of the day is an experience. Personality. This is a pretty straightforward one. Um, again, Apple versus Microsoft. This is the classic example of, of personifying their brand. Um, so in this section, it's all just about thinking about what are the personality words that describe my game. Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it angry? Is it obnoxious? Is it in my face? Is it quiet? Is it unassuming? You know, there's a million personality words, which is why I haven't written any up there. So we are going to do this one quickly because it should be pretty straightforward and easy after the other ones. Um, basically, it's just about listing them down on the sheet. But then what you've got to do is say, what are the top three? If someone met your game in a bar and walked away, what are the three words they'd use to describe the person? Yeah. Max, I've mentioned it to this group here. So one of the reasons why personality is so important is um, consistency. And one of the things you use positioning for, apart from the marketing materials, is um, making decisions about your game design as you go and needing a guide just to say, well, is this part, should this be part of the game or not part of the game? Right? And this whole positioning thing helps you in doing that because once you've defined your personality or your, you know, the emotional rewards or what is the core hook of the game, when you're making a decision about, okay, should this feature be in the game or not? Or should we have this character or not? You've got some guide towards it. So when you're thinking about your personality, and you've got it defined, make sure everything from the way you present the website, the Twitter, the press release, the menu screen, the gameplay is all consistent so that the player is not kind of like, well, I've got this happy, nice, jolly kind of menu screen um, or humorous press release and then the game's all about, you know, like murder simulator. It doesn't really work. So, Okay, so this is the last section and it's kind of the most fun. Um, definitely not one that you should overthink. Um, Basically, Friends in Bizarro is about now taking these things that you've been thinking about and putting them onto real-world objects. So this is just a list, and you'll see in the, in the sheet there's kind of um, boxes for these, but you can happily change them. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, you know, if I was a car, what would the car be? Um, so, you know, Call of Duty would be a Hummer. 
you know, military, big, obnoxious in your face, you know, um, could be other vehicles, uh, could be something like a unit, had a unicycle come up for one of my clients recently, for example, because it's quite hard to ride, but once you get on it, it you know, you kind of feel pretty awesome. Um, could be a drink, what kind of drink, could be alcoholic, could non be, not be al alcoholic, types of food, um, types of lollies, um, actors is always good because we, you know, we understand an actor's personality or character's personality so well. Um, movies, TV shows, uh, characters, superheroes is always pretty good because superheroes are very distinct character archetypes. You know, they tend to have like two or three things that are very specific to the character, so they're nice and sort of uncomplicated. Um, could be musical styles, so you know, is it country music, is it heavy metal, is it classical music, and so on. Classical and heavy metal come up a lot for some reason in this. Um, had one that was reggae music recently. Um, particular bands, what would it wear, what animal would it be, and is there a colour that kind of, you know, typically sort of um, personifies this game. So don't overthink it. Um, Friends is basically the things that would be your game. Bizarro is the opposite, you know, sort of things that wouldn't be. The, the trick with Bizarro is not just to put down things which it isn't, but to put the opposite of what it is. Because it's really easy to say, oh, you know, it's not reality TV shows, but because you think it's drama, but why is that the opposite of drama? You know what I mean? Like, so it's in that sort of thinking about what is the opposite that, again, you'll sort of get, get to the nuance of why you think it is a particular thing. Again, 10 minutes, just throw them down, you've got plenty of time to do more. Okay. How did everyone go with that one? It can be quite a hard one to do in a short space of time, but it's quite good fun. Uh, as I say, the key thing here, once you've got your list, is to Google search all the images and put together like a mood board, a slide on PowerPoint, or uh, you know, a mood board on the wall, um, so that you can sort of be reminded of all these things as you're, you're looking and making decisions on your games and uh, what, what would Roger Moore do or whatever, whoever the actors and stuff you, you've got on there. Um, so look, that's essentially the process. Um, so it's really now about sort of putting these things together, which we won't have time to do today. But you know, each of the sections at, at the back, you've got like a summary sheet where you can sort of bring the key points out of it, and all that moves towards basically your your positioning summary. And what I normally do is is craft a single sentence for the positioning, which uh, basically encapsulates everything from the game, and see if I can bring it down to three core words. Um, just really to, to condense everything that you talk about. So you, we don't need to do this now, but um, what I would suggest, like I say, is go through this exercise again, go through it in about a week or two weeks so that you've got a bit of space from here, go through your notes, try and involve other people, um, you know, explain the game, show the, show the game to them, get them to be involved in the process, and then um, complete it again and do the positioning summary. Um, and then a good thing to do is, a couple of days later, actually write up those notes into like a PowerPoint um, slide or something that you can refer to, um, but do that afterwards so that you've got the process of converting handwritten notes to, um, you know, the designed sheet because that will give you another pass through and another layer of thinking about it. This isn't really something that you can kind of do within two hours and, and you know, you've got the answer there in front of you. You've got to kind of be thinking about it a, a few times to kind of refine it. Um, so that is essentially it. I'm happy to take a few questions about the process or, or other things now. And what would you recommend after this process? I mean, obviously, this, this, doing this type of thing is the first thing you do when you get a game towards marketing. Yeah. Beyond this, say we've done this like months and months and we know this back to front, where do you go from there when you've got this pretty good plan? Yep, so you use this uh, when you're crafting all the messaging, when it comes to writing the press release, when you're coming to design the, the website. Um, but critically, it needs to be a reference tool during design. So I like to get involved in a game about six months before launch. On the, on the iOS space and do this within that first month or so of, of getting involved in the project because it will help um, influence design decisions as much as it will marketing decisions. If you do this right before launch, which I have done, it, it's fine, but then something might come up and it's like, oh, well, we haven't got time to turn the game around now to that aspect and so you sort of restrict yourself. So what you should be doing is using it regularly, referring to it, not just putting it in a, in a drawer, like make the mood boards. Um, I have a template which I could probably give Anthony which um, you know, lays out the various slides in, in certain ways. Um, print them out, put them on your wall so it's always there. Um, but it, it's not designed to be something that you just do and forget. It's, it's sort of like your Bible in a way of, of um, you know, what you're doing. And it should form part of a, you know, your marketing plan, including, okay, these are the key messages that we're going to be putting out here and this is the way that we're going to sort of be pitching it. 
Awesome. Thanks, guys. That was a really enjoyable experience for me doing a stream like this. So. Good. Uh, it was really good. I really enjoyed Tim's presentation. There was a, a few good things that he, re he reinforced there, and a few, a few new things that I enjoyed, especially some links to the place like Game Press and all that. So I'm going to be looking into that when I get home. And then suddenly, when I got to the end, I started realizing what I was do doing it was defining my product that I uh, like I wanted to make, and especially that that word exercise of working, working out friends of Bizarro. Um, suddenly, and also the three words that be, um, define the personality of the game. Suddenly I understand, to a certain degree, what marketing companies do to brand a product, how to sort of give it a personality. Instead of actually thinking about, uh, you know, marketing games, it was kind of like trying to figure out, trying to put your game into perspective and relate it in such a way that you could easily kind of um, imply what the game, the feelings of the game and how they actually relate and how it can actually, you know, give the connotations to someone by using reference. So it was a really interesting concept and um, I'd like to talk into it a little bit more when I get home. The workshop was very good for having a look at, you know, the target audience and, and the design of it. But given that most of my design is essentially done, uh, it was the marketing and the contacts that I really want to pick up from this. So I've got emails for Tim and for Chris, and I'll definitely be giving them a call and hitting them up. Yeah. Yeah.